Dr. Fisher, virologist here today. I'm going to be talking about a scenario, a future scenario. I'm very interested in future studies and the relationship between how we imagine the future, how we come to bring about those futures we imagine and or how we actually resist those futures that we imagine or are even afraid to imagine. Those are really important issues as you can even imagine. Here we are in 2021 and facing incredible challenges. Don't need to repeat all that information and scenarios. Um, we're in a difficult time. However, the good news is that I offer, and I think others have indicated that they can offer a fearlessness paradigm. And this is not just now, but throughout all of history. Um, more or less, this fearlessness movement, this fearlessness intelligence um, toward what I'm crafting as a fearlessness paradigm is available to humanity, to you as an individual, to groups, to institutions, societies, and the global world and its problematique. Of these great and sometimes called wicked problems. So that's uh, what I want to take you through this morning is a scenario I've been thinking about and I was just journaling this morning coming to this idea of how could I demonstrate, um, and this is for me as much as anybody, uh, fearlessness paradigm operating in a real situation. Because it's really extremely hard to find real situations, at least I have not been able to find people capable, willing, etc to actually engage a fearlessness paradigm um, it's a difficult concept to market if you want to put it in blunt terms so i thought well if i really set up a scenario i could walk you through as you're viewing and you could share this with the world as much as you like and to people that might really be able to use this notion of a fearlessness paradigm in their work so let me start with the scenario Basically, I'm looking at, let's just say in the year 2021, some wide group of people, it'd be something like the United Nations that cares about the whole of the planet. Thinking at that world-centric perspective, not just an ethnocentric or a nationalistic or even an egocentric perspective, but world-centric perspective. We have to solve these world problems, obviously, global climate change, global warming, whatever we want to call it, this tr great tragedy and challenge that we have before us as humanity, no one is excluded from having to try to solve this problem. So that's a good start. There's, there's other ones, right? We could look at the uh, nuclear war problem and potential dis disaster of blowing up the entire planet or making it at least um, to the degree that it would be, life would not hardly be capable of living under a, a full nuclear attack on many fronts from many countries. So we have to cooperate. So that's where the United Nations starts, right? And notions like that, world-centric is about how do we cooperate? So here's the scenario more specifically. A large group of people for one year was tasked to go out and interview and collect data from people about the world's problems. And this included people from the lowest levels of poverty and suffering and struggle. They were asked, they were supported to come to at least some meetings to be able to share their views, all the way up to the top people who are top thinkers in all the various disciplines, philosophy, sociology, psychology, world studies, politics, science, etc., arts. So collected all that data for a whole year. They had a massive database that put all that data in one place. So we had all these world issues and perspectives from different people on those world issues. Okay, got it? That's the database meta big database and then they had researchers who were also looking at all the history um, prior to 2021 and collecting all that data from all the same kinds of sources but mostly published sources because they're most available from people who have come and no longer live with us on this planet and we took all that data and put it into this big pot of information, knowledge. 
And so we have this great database and then we kept getting a smaller group down this particular group and they were going to, you know, kind of analyze, find the big, pick out the big themes of that data. Then they were going to take another year to present that data and they would bring in people of different voices, as I say, from people right down in the uh, quote uneducated, formerly uneducated, all the way up to the highest levels of our educational, formal educational systems, et cetera, experts from around the world. And they would actually come and present that data now in themes and actual real voices of their opinions as well, some of these, to a kind of like a panel, a huge panel, which were almost kind of like judges. Let's just say there was 13 of them like a supreme court but this would be a supreme world jury that's going to judge in the end to find make a final judgment on all this data except what they decided as a group of 13 of these very highly picked people capable of making that decision or a world decision on these problems they said well we want to we want a jury we want another jury of the people so uh, we will help make that decision, but we want a jury to come to us with their solutions first and how to proceed to solve these world's worst problems. So that was fine. So they picked another jury of, let's just say they picked 100 people on that jury. Okay, so um, the year long process of hearing that data, the 100 jury members were listening to it and again they're from all diversities remember this was the whole idea to keep a diverse set of perspectives and listening ears and different intelligences listening and then the panel of the 13 um, top judges would would be there listening to the data with them and questions may be going back and forth in discussion so just imagine that for another year and then they were given after the end of that year, another year. So you can see this is a three year process of solving these world's wicked problems. I think it's great. That's my opinion, what needs to be done. So then the, that's where I'm gonna come in. Um, in the third year of this jury going off in their retreat space to do this analysis for a year, at the six month point, there were some problems. I was given a phone call. Hey, could you come in and maybe help this group? They're kind of stuck. And we hear that you've done some consulting with groups that get stuck or family therapy, where families get stuck and making decisions or private clients. So you seem to have some experience. We've heard you're doing something with this fear and fearlessness stuff, it seems to be your expertise. So we, we just, Got somebody told us that you should probably come down. Yeah, okay, I'll be down there. Um, and and though they said be prepared to be with this group helping them for the next six months, but they're at the halfway process of having to come up with their decision to bring back to the thirteen judges. Oh, okay, yeah, sure, I'll be. So I show up at the, the retreat where they're at. They're very kind fed me well, got to know me a little bit. They were a little intrigued, a little estranged as well. Some people of what's this guy going to do to help us study sphere and fearlessness, what the heck? That was a mild comment. And uh, so I just calmly, you know, sat in the room with them the first day and I asked them, so, the one thing I said is to start, so you're here to cooperate. This whole process, you're in the third year of a process of cooperation on a world perspective of how to solve these problems. And they said, yeah, yeah, we are. And every one of them agreed that they were here to cooperate. And then I asked them, I said, I said oh, great, 100% that you believe, all of you, that you're here to cooperate. You're on a three-year process of mass cooperation on a global scale to solve these global problems. 
Then I asked them, how many of you are actually cooperating? And there were some reluctant eyes and reluctant hands to go up. I don't remember how many of each, I didn't count them, but it, I can just tell you it was not the quick 100% agreement as compared to the first question I asked. So I said, all right, well, this is more or less what I wanna find out. I'm gonna ask some questions. So the next question I thought of asking them, because they, they admitted, you know, they were kind of stuck, right, at the six month point. That's why they brought me in, just keep that in mind. And being stuck is not a bad thing. I, I tried to convince them of that. That took a while because they were, some of them were feeling they maybe were failing and some of them were even getting perhaps, you know, really worried that they weren't going to come. In fact, quite a few were worried as I chatted with them at coffee break and other things. Uh, moments. But officially, everybody was, you know, trying their best. Great. Looks like cooperation. But when I asked them again, how many of you are really cooperating fully all the time? That was very few hands went up. And what I found out is because it's hard to cooperate when you have conflict. And that's what they told me. I said, yeah, it is. Cooperation's easy when you all kind of agree on enough basis of things, phenomenon, to actually move forward. But when you get enough conflict, you're not going to move forward. So I said, well, I'm not coming in as a conflict resolution expert. I said, there's people who could help you do that work, perhaps. But I'm going to start with the work that I do. I'm going to bring a fearlessness paradigm to this conversation, to this process of decision making and of course people you know for the most part had no idea what that was and I said well I'm just going to demonstrate it rather than try to describe what a fearlessness paradigm is and that's what I'm doing with you in this video demonstrating rather than trying to define and describe which can be done but it's much more complex fearlessness paradigm um, other than I said a paradigm is basically a way of asserting a certain number of beliefs, assumptions, practices that go with those beliefs that provide a particular kind of methodology that then can collect data to then be solved um, within the thinking of that which that paradigm has built its premises upon, right? Its belief systems upon it. So that's what a kind of paradigm represents. It's a way of organizing to solve a problem. And it's good to be aware what your paradigm is. Most people are not, and this group was not aware of their paradigm. So I started with paradigm, defined it briefly for them. Didn't try to define fearlessness, I said, but I'll start with a set of questions. So you're stuck, that's it. You're in conflict. And I'm going to try and pursue that conflict through a set of questioning. Here we go. Your listeners paradigm in action. I basically said, has the word concept fear been brought forward at all? As you know, in this six months that you've been deliberating as a jury on a judgment. No, it has not been tabled as one of the themes of the data collected, nor of their process of trying to interpret and make a judgment on those things. I said, thanks very much. I needed to know that. Then I asked the question, how many of you feel fear, have felt fear during this six months process? All hands go up, except a few. Okay. So we've been feeling something that we have not been talking about as actually part of the decision-making going on, correct? They were reluctant to just say whether I was right or wrong or accurate, but they're listening. Some eyes are turning, oh, um, is this guy getting out of here? You could just sort of feel the vibes 
conflict. There was conflict with me. There was conflict with me bringing the fearlessness paradigm into the group, adding another complexity of conflict to the already conflict they had of just trying to decide on how to interpret the data, what decisions to make with the data. But now we had a, I was bringing in a conflict of paradigms because I then began to more or less say and ask questions to sort through um, their paradigm conflicts going on in this room. Didn't say it that way, but that's what I'm snooping for using my fearlessness paradigm. I'm coming in to snoop out what those paradigms are in conflict that are actually afraid of each other as paradigms, different paradigms people are operating in. For the most part, unconsciously operating in. So as I probed on this question of fear, I remember somebody in the group said, um, Dr. Fisher, um, one of our disagreements hasn't been so much we were talking about fear, but we were really talking about love. Oh, good, I said. All right, that's a good start. Love and fear, often seen as opposites within all the wisdom traditions I've found pretty much around the world, more or less can be pinned down to a very thematic schema of these meta emotions, not even an emotion per se, but it's like a meta emotion. It's like a mega archetypal emotion called love and fear, which are actually, as I explained a little theory from my research, and this is empirical research I've actually done. And any of you can look it up and I told them, I've written lots on love and fear um, over the last 30 years. And so I said, that's, those are like two different paradigms. And the reason I said, well, why did love come up? And they said, well, because there's a whole group of us, about a third of the group that thinks that we can solve the world's problems. We've got the information. We just need to be more loving. Mm -hmm. Take that in for a minute. How real that would be out of a hundred people trying to, in this situation, Imagine yourself in that situation. If we only had more love. And their argument then was, okay, so what's so great about love? Well, then we'd have more harmony. And so, so what's great, great, so great about harmony? Well, we'd have less, less conflict. Uh -huh. So what's the advantage of all that? We'd be more cooperative. Because they had, remember, I, they had already admitted they weren't, they wanted to be cooperative and they were trying to be, but they found they couldn't be because of the conflict. They didn't agree on many aspects, which most juries do not for the most part is my guess. I've never been on a jury, but you can just imagine. And then some juries split, right? Well, this is where they were at. A hundred people in a room representing the planet Earth. So this is the sample we have. And I would say, yeah, probably about a third of that group, I'm just gonna suggest, somewhere in there, maybe it's a quarter, um, would be saying, well, we just need to be more loving. So they were trying to bring a paradigm. They're trying in, intuitively to bring a, a loving paradigm based on love. Of course, that's a complex notion of what is love. <laughs> um, but they had enough sense of what it was, common sense. And that, that would bring a solution, you know, that that would help oil the situation, the, add a grease to the situation, to, to make it more fluid, to, to make those conflicts of differences maybe slide together a little easier under the paradigm of love. And so I was coming in and I told them, I says, well, you know, I don't think the love paradigm will work. I think it's interesting to bring forward and I'm glad that it's being included. So. The, I just gave an example there of how a fearlessness paradigm thinks. It does not fall into a love paradigm as a solution or a fear paradigm as a solution, but something larger that encompasses both love and fear. So that's the fearlessness paradigm being demonstrated. Then there was a large group, um, about a third of the people who said, oh no, we need to bring a whole lot more fear and just facts so that we're much more afraid and that we'll actually cooperate because we have so much fear 
about the facts. So let's stick to the facts. They were arguing this other third or of the hundred people. And let's just be, let that fear really sink in how dangerous the situation is. And, and then we'll cooperate because we kind of have to, we're in this room. And some people said, oh, okay, well, maybe that will work, maybe, you know, but as I say, there was a third of the group that wanted to go in that direction. And I said, okay, so now in the room, I'm just asking, so th there's the love people and then there's the fear-based people, right? Um, let's use a love-based approach. Let's use a fear-based par approach or paradigm to bring the process of handling and managing conflict better. I said, well, you know, a fearlessness paradigm is not really going to buy one of those or the other as the way to go. So I'm just letting you know, I'm not saying that you have to adopt my paradigm, but I'm just going to show you why I don't think that will work, either one of those. And of course, in the end, those are going to still stay in conflict. So you're going to have a paradigm conflict between love and fear based approaches. Okay. I said, so where's the other rest of the people who don't just buy the love paradigm, they don't buy the fear paradigm? Well, there's about a third of the group, as it turns out, that sat in kind of the middle neutral, may even been more than a third. And they were what's called the undecided. So almost, and you see this pattern of this 100 people that I'm setting up here. So this is for the viewer's sake. And I did explain this a little bit to those people in that jury. Sound familiar? Conservatives, liberals, divided, undecided group of voters, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, pretty much the same pattern will show up. I'm just sort of suggesting theoretically, universally, and if you bring a broad enough diverse group of people together to try and solve some kind of problems, right, to interpret them and then come up with solutions, you pretty much are going to get that divide. That same pattern, get it? Yeah, those three components at least. And, and then there may be, you know, even some more subtle extreme components within that hundred, which there usually is, and they will even cause more problems than just even what I've just described. Um, I've actually lived this when I lived in a housing cooperative community where nobody owned the property per se, but we were all you know, contributors to and running this community of approximately 100 people, um, more or less. And I was there for with my wife, partner, and my daughters for a while for you know 10 year process. And I'll tell you, I, I, I learned and saw exactly how that worked. And we were a cooperative, right? We were there, we signed an agreement to cooperate as a cooperative to run this housing complex. Whoa, I learned so much. And it was real. So as I then sort of thought, what we've got now is people who are bringing in, you know, the love approach, which is very kind of emotional, and even irrational or irrational, they, they really wanted to bring emotions and feelings forward, this loving and caring that we could you know, then really cooperate, find a higher ground in love. And then some of those people even wanted to, you know, bring in notions of their God and so on, but they realized, well, everybody in this group is, is not religious in terms of a, believing in a theistic, you know, savior and reference point for, for all goodness. So that caused the conflict too. So it wasn't going to work. And the rationalist people who says, you know, let's use rational data and fear have, uh, that wasn't gonna work either because the love people didn't like fear being running the show or being the main motivator for coming to cooperation. Even though we all sort of agreed, well, in some situations fear can really mobilize and get people to cooperate like an emergency fire, you have to act. But is that the best way to make decisions on these wicked complex global problems? Yeah, we're in an emergency at some level, but. Um, emergency time and emergency, you know, fear-based approaches um, are probably just going to exacerbate and bring more of the problem. So we still had problems, <laughs> you know, after all that long discussion, I think we went for a lunch break, uh, came back and I'm thinking, okay, you know, where do I go now? 
And so I only had, you know, short half hour left in the day when we came back after lunch. And I was kind of hoping, well, maybe they'll invite me back for another session because in one session, I really couldn't do full justice to the fearlessness paradigm and all of how it can help solve the problem. And that will be similar to the video we're doing today. I wanted to make this short as an introduction to how to approach a fearlessness paradigm. So I suggested to them after the lunch break, okay, I'm just going to summarize now. Um, I think you you know I pretty much laid out what problem we're in now. We're at a meta metacognitive level. We're we're trying to understand our understanding. We're trying to put a lens or a perspective on how we're approaching this problem, not just what the details of the problem are. So, so that was, I was trying to unite people in their differences and then the undecided. I was trying to say there's a larger framework here, which is metacognitive. It means it's a cognition about our cognition. It's our problem thinking about how we think about problems. That was the beginning of a fearlessness perspective because the fearlessness perspective takes no perspective. Not quite true, but I just said that to literally capture your attention. The fearlessness perspective says 24 7, 360 degrees awareness about all possibilities. Stay open to that at all times, and that will be the practice of fearlessness beginning. To stay open means we have to stay vulnerable to that possibility of leaving the undecided. Keeping doors open, windows open, our minds and hearts open. I'm not using the word love, but you can use whatever word you want for all of what I just said. You know, awareness of a globality, a multiplicity of complexity to situate are being together. And if we can at least get to the, that use of the tool, a metacognitive tool, I said, well, the metacognitive tool I'm bringing in is a fearlessness paradigm. So you can either be in those places of tensions, undecided, you only got six months left, maybe you'll get through it and come to you know a full agreement of how to give your answers to the judge and your um, judge at the end of the six months or you might not you might end up still stuck for the next six months i was just giving them another wheel right like another center paradigm to work with and i said the one thing about the fearlessness paradigm you know i said this is all i have time today for you um, to be able to introduce to you is that what i realized when i asked the question earlier of you that fear had not been brought onto the table of discussion during the whole time of your six months together. And, and many people said, well, yeah, we all were worried. That's why we're here. It's like, why talk about fear? We know we're afraid of what's happening to the planet and we have worry. And I go, yeah, uh, yeah, but that's all implicit. And it's all based on your notions of, of you had those feelings, but you didn't want to make feelings or your intuitions and your worries or concerns. You didn't want to make that a concept of workability as a theme. And that's why the word fear did not show up as one of your workable themes of the global problem that you're trying to solve. And that you didn't therefore keep it above awareness, right? The word fear. So I said, the fearlessness perspective, this paradigm, is going to keep the word fear flowing continually in a circle like this, in the center of your room. And, I, and then I even suggested what I, because if I don't come back, I said, at least make a, a big table in the center of your big circle that you're already sitting, put another table. It's kind of like a, an altar almost, if you want to use that language, or just a centerpiece. And I said, you know, put the word fear on it in a big circle on signs or something, and even words that sound or you know synonymous with the word fear, and put those on signs as well, and so on, and just keep them on the table so that they're out there 
as you're working on your bigger circle, you're continually looking into the center of the circle as well as looking at your colleagues and around the big circle. And you're continually looking at that center circle. And you see all that word fear, right? In the whole, for the word, different words for fear, and et cetera. And then I said, in the center of that circle of those fear cards that you kind of put out there, I said, you know, put some kind of image there um, that represents fearlessness. And what I suggest is that, you know, each of you bring in and draw a picture of or paint something or sculpt something, do it in an artistic process where fearlessness is how you would like to represent it. So everybody, the 100 people all get to represent it and then you can kind of glue it together in a big sculpture in the middle. <laughs> By about that time, um, some people were either sleeping um, or tired and exhausted or some were really intrigued, a few. And, uh, you know, a lot were just kind of like, no, oh, really, you know, well, we're going to be playing with art materials and things like, well, because the other part of the fearlessness paradigm demonstrate is we have to think in a, a rational way. It's not irrational, not rational per se, but includes rational and irrational, but puts them into a center of a rationality. And that would be another um, talk or lecture that I could do for you. If some of you are interested, I, I could do a talk on that. Um, let me know. Um, put your comments of, on this video in the middle and uh, on the comment box below. And if you feel this video is worth sharing, um, please do share it with people who are trying to solve complex difficulties, wicked problems.